we praise God for all of you who have joined us for worship this Sunday, online and in the church sanctuary. Aren't you just glad to be alive and uh, to have, amen, to have the activity of your limbs, of your mind, you have, you have your faculty, you have your wits. We thank God that he's allowing those nerve endings, those synapses to fire off and keep us animated and keep us going. Uh, God is worthy to be praised. Amen. God is worthy no matter what. 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 God is still worthy to be praised. Through, through the good times, through the bad times, through the happy times, through the sad times. God is worthy to be praised. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So we thank all of you who are present with us. You take one step, God will take two. Dear God, we thank you for this moment. It is pregnant with all kinds of possibilities. You said that your word would not return void, but it would accomplish the very thing for which you sent it out to accomplish. God, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for your consistency, your faithfulness, your, your prospering of us. We are prosperous. And we thank you for that. You. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow. James, the half-brother of Jesus, must have been fed up with what he was seeing and hearing in the precincts, fellowship halls, church offices, conference rooms, church parlors, and definitely with what he was hearing on the ubiquitous church parking lots. You know, every black church has a church parking lot, even if it doesn't have a church parking lot. <laughs> Y'all have heard what goes on normally on a whole lot of church parking lots after worship and after those real tense and strained meetings that we sometimes hold. The parking lot is where plans are hatched, sometimes hatched to win the neighborhood for Jesus. New ministry plans are birthed as people talk on the church parking lot, but far too often, the church parking lot is where plans are hatched to blow off hot air or to, to discuss the latest bit of church gossip or to plan your recrimination or to plan your response to some attack that you have felt or to point out the flaws in somebody else you just came out of church worshiping with. That's often what our church parking lots are for or we make them. We misuse them for those purposes. James evidently had heard enough. Read through chapters 3 and 4 and tell me that James is holding anything back. Tell me that James is only in this particular epistle sharing niceties with the saints and being witty and being coy and being careful theologically and pulling punches as he tries to give to people what the Lord has given to him. No, James is not holding anything back. James didn't have a lot of time to be real nice and diplomatic during this part of his journey with the Lord. At this point in James' life, maybe he was thinking that he had already wasted enough time. Calvary, according to the way the traditional story goes, James, who was now the leader of the Jerusalem church, had already squandered several years of his life living in unbelief, living disconnected from the burgeoning and growing church, living disconnected from Jesus, living for years with his siblings and them not fully believing the rumors he had heard whispered at family gatherings that his brother, Jesus, was really somebody special. 
Just as Mama Mary had been trying to tell the younger children all of their lives. And that James's daddy and Jesus' daddy weren't exactly the same in all that it means to be the same biological father. So they weren't fully biological brothers of the same two parents. Christian tradition teaches us that the author of this letter, James, was the half-brother of Jesus. In fact, according to Sister Girl Scholar, the Presbyterian minister and scholar out of Howard University, Gay L. Byron, there are new findings in biblical scholarship which seem to affirm and confirm that the half-brother of Jesus was really the author of this text as had been traditionally thought. And church tradition tells us that it was not until Jesus had risen from the dead, more than three years after Jesus had been walking in his public ministry, it was three years afterwards that James had really started putting his whole trust for salvation, for deliverance, for hope, for healing, for forgiveness of sins in his brother as the Messiah of the entire world and the Lord and Savior of his very own soul. It is thought that after the resurrection event and after Jesus' ascension to glory, that these, these experiences, experiences had clinched it for James. And so if you read how James is writing the word of God as he gives pastoral advice and as he gives judgment and as he defines what true religion is from false religion, as he writes about the danger of the tongue. Yeah, we get all of that in James. We can easily see that he is not one who minces words to make his point. Now, he, he's not trying to hate on anyone either, but I guess he feels like. Hey, this is serious business, a, a glorious business, and, and I must make up for lost time. Hence, James gives a sharp and pointed uh, criticism of those who don't seem to be willing to yield to the spirit. And he's giving sharp and pointed theological instruction and practical church advice in this letter. And the tone of this letter is very blunt especially as he reflects upon how he had noticed what he saw and was hearing with Christians who were living in diaspora. That means Christians who were spread out all over the then known world. James was observing what was happening in the church. And I guess as he writes this general letter to the church universal, he feels, hey, I only got so much time. I've squandered time. I might as well be blunt. Given what he's seeing on church parking lots and hearing in the vestibules of the churches he frequents, um, he says, look, I'm just going to let it out. I'm just going to say what God has put on my heart. Sisters and brothers, have you ever felt like you needed to make up for lost time and you didn't have time to play religious games? Have you ever been there and you knew that you didn't even have time to play religious games with yourself, let alone anybody else? The Lord was trying to call you to some act of service years ago or to just a closer walk with Jesus months ago. But you got distracted. You allowed yourself to be delayed. You had other interests or you were worried that God would change your life too much. Or, or maybe you doubted that you deserve the kind of attention that preachers and teachers of the faith have been telling you all the time that God wants to show you. So you never responded to those inner urgings and nudgings of the Holy Spirit. You, you did not want to an answer. So you suppressed it. You sat on top of it of it you push God's wooing you away God's courtship of you away you pushed it away and in fact now that you look back over those wasted months and years you actually think hey not only did I push those feelings away I in essence push God away metaphorically speaking but how many of you know you can't really push God away 
our arms are too short yeah. to box with God. Our, our, our hands are too weak. Our shoulders are too weak to push God out of the experience of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad about that. Yeah. But maybe, maybe, maybe you have felt differently. You felt like your, your, maybe you felt like your ship came in and you were somewhere else at the wrong port, sitting at the wrong dock of the bay, watching the wrong tides roll away. Your, your, your tide, your moment was at the other end of the port and it was coming in, but you missed it. 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 And now that COVID quarantining has you hemmed in a bit more than usual, it has bridled your comings and goings a little bit more than you would normally be operating, more than you would normally be coming and going. So now you sense like, maybe uh, I feel like James and how he felt. I better take inventory. I've wasted enough time with my fraternity and sorority brothers and sisters. Hey, I spent enough time traveling around the world, seeing the world. I've taken too many detours already. The clock is ticking. The hourglass is getting lighter at the top. And my gray hairs are getting gray hairs. So, so now I'm going to answer the spirit's urgent call. Yes. The spirit's wooing of me. Because I've been sensing that nothing is going to be quite right until I answer the spirits bidding me to come and come and follow him more deliberately and more earnestly. I, I think it was that, uh, 19th, that 19th century hymn writer, Ernest Blandy, who wrote in 1890, I can hear my savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow, follow me. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Jesus is not wasting, James rather, James is not wasting any time or words at this point. He has given his heart over to the spirit. He is filled with the Holy Ghost and his letters are focused like a laser in attempts to instruct God's people as he lays out a theology to help them to walk right and believe right. So in this letter, he even takes on a misreading of the apostle Paul at one point. Paul writes those immortal words in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that faith that you have, that has saved you, it doesn't even originate with you. But it is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast of their works. That was Paul's theology in a nutshell. And yet people were taking that and running with it the wrong way. There were folk in the early first century community were saying, listen, because God is the one who gives me faith, God is the one who gives me grace, I can live on the edges. I can live any kind of way and God is going to forgive me. God is going to continue to give me faith and belief to trust uh, that he is my savior. James said, hey, hold it. So James comes along and says, faith or trust is important, but it must go from the head and heart to the hands and feet and tongue. What we think on the inside, what we believe on the inside must eventually turn to good works on the outside. So he writes in James chapter two and verse 26, faith without works is dead. Y'all heard that verse before I see Amen. Faith without works is dead. This is James, the half brother of Jesus, a former skeptic turned spiritual leader. James is not mincing words as he writes his heart out to the church. And in our text in chapters three and four, he cannot get any plainer. At the onset of this text, he is addressing the church and espouses that we are not walking with God as we should if we are operating out of a false wisdom, he calls it a devilish wisdom that masquerades as true godly wisdom. 
Here James gives us a text that when I need to discern what kind of spirit is motivating me, I try to stop by this text just to do inventory in my own life just to interrogate myself and to ask myself, Greg, Brian, what kind of enlightenment is working through you right now? Is it from God or is it from yourself? In this text, the spirit working in and through James reminds how to self-assess and discern in others when the spirit of God's true wisdom is at work in us and through us. Or when it is a carnal wisdom and devilish wisdom that is at work in our thinking, in our believing, in our plans, and in our actions. How many of you all want the right kind of wisdom working through you? Y'all want God's wisdom and not the devil's insight. So he writes, he gives us some handles here so that we can discern where we are in this thing. He writes, if you have bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag, don't lie against the truth. Such wisdom, James says, such light, such insight is not coming from above, but it rises up from below and drifts into your soul. It is earthly, it is sensual, it is devilish, it is unspiritual. Now, you might be asking, why is this important in light of our main thought for the morning? You take one step and God will take two. It is important because James is first describing what he has noticed as people get stuck in life. And now they're not walking towards God. They're not making any movement toward God in their relationship with God and others. They're stuck. They're static. It is important to note because it is far too easy, easier than we often realize to operate out of that wisdom that is from below and not even uh, then we don't, oftentimes we still don't really realize it when we're operating out of it because the kind of wisdom that leads to unnecessary conflict, James says, ungodly conflict, there is good godly conflict. There are some things that the spirit will stir up. But there is ungodly conflict. And James says those things that call warring among you and factions and schisms and cliques and me against you and you against me. That wisdom always sweetly and enticingly appeals to your own self-interest every time. In other words, it's going to feel good to you. But like I've said before and others have told me, everything that feels good to you ain't good for you. Excuse me for that bad English, but it's good theology. <laughs> it is a wisdom that is always, I'm talking about this devilish wisdom, it's always assessing what will I get out of the deal? How will this affect me? And will this leave me on top over you or will you be over me? It feels good in the moment, this kind of wisdom, and this is why it is so seductive. James says that it is selfish, it envies, and it has bitterness attached to it. Oh, Lord, we don't want to have bitterness in our lives at all. It's hard to get rid of bitterness. You talk about something that will block you from moving toward God, taking any steps toward God. It will be bitterness. bitterness. Bitterness can deceive you into thinking that all is right with your walk with God. And yet God is looking at you like, aren't you about to come to the altar so you can repent of, the, of this issue you have of harboring hatred in your heart toward this person or that situation? Bitterness is something that will sink your spiritual ship. Martin Buber the Jewish and German mystic and philosopher wrote a book entitled I and Thou. You can say that softly with me. I and Thou. I and Thou. In it, Buber explains that humanity in its fallen state often operates out of a self-centeredness that leads people to only form I and it relationships. Follow his thinking. I and it relationships where I'm the subject and you're the object. I'm the key person in this whole deal. You're kind of the 
the, the person I'm going to objectify in this situation. And this is how it shows up. I and it relationships. When you are in relationships with others, you're only looking at others to see what they can do for you. How they make you feel. What if they ruffle your feathers? Well, well then I'm done with them. What if they challenge your authority? Then they can't serve and walk with me. Why? Because then I need to, as an I who is the subject, I need to get rid of and objectify anybody who's trying to mess up my throne. Boober said, no, we cannot exist well in I and it relationships. We are walking in ungodliness, he says. But if we really want to see God, we have to form I and thou relationships. He says when you use the word thou, when you think of the concept of thou, you're talking about another person who is on your level. Another person who has feelings just like you do, who cries just like you do, who rejoices just like you do, who is just as important before God as you are. That's an I-thou relationship instead of an I-it relationship. So let me ask you a question. As you think about your relationships in the church, in your home, what kind of relationships are you forming? If you are one who is, and I'm sorry, I'm off script now. I'm just going to receive whatever the spirit is giving. If you, if you are one who is always looking at your relationships to see how they affect you. How this person is affecting you. Did they hurt my feelings? Are they blessing me with anything? How much are they bringing to the table? It's okay to make those assessments in some situations, so don't mishear me. However, if that's your primary mode of operation, then you're functioning out of an I-it perspective. You've got to look at other people, no matter how fallen they are, no matter if they don't bring anything to your table and know that they've got a table somewhere. You've got to know that they got just as much value before God as you do. You've got to realize that God is not looking down or looking out on us and saying, look, I got my favorites in this church and I got folk who are kind of on the outside on the, in this part of the church. No, that's why we've got to treat our brothers and sisters well in God's church because all ground is equal at the foot of the cross. This unrighteous wisdom we need to get rid of. James says that a wisdom that masquerades as true wisdom keeps us from a closer walk with God and with our sisters and brothers. Even with Bibles tucked under our arms proudly and a scripture verse written and kept behind our ears and preaching all in our mouths and songs all in our mouths and church protocol and Presbyterian disciplines and polity all in our background. We can still have evil working on us and in us. It doesn't matter how much culture you have or I have. It doesn't matter how religious we seem to be or don't or aren't, it doesn't matter if we have titles behind our names or in front of our names or no titles. We can be six or we can be 60 and still have the wisdom that is from below motivating our actions and behaviors. You know, sisters and brothers, I love my grandson, Christian. I love Christian from the depths of my soul. I love Christian. It was a whole lot going into us making sure that he got here. And I, I, I praise God that he's here, but I've watched my grandson closely and God bless his precious little heart. After he reached a certain age, around 14 months, he, he discovered something and it was a human-centered wisdom. He knew how to fake a little whimpering cry <laughs> that sounded just like his regular cry. Almost. And he learned that about 14 months, if he wanted to get his way, if he wanted to manipulate the situation, he would start this. <laughs> no tears coming out of his eyes. No reason for him to be acting like this. It's time to go to break bed, Christian. <laughs> then he would start yelling. But no tears would be coming out of his eyes. 
Now, listen, he learned that from something. He came here with that kind of wisdom working in his heart. And so uh, we've got to ask ourselves the same question. Do I operate like that? Do I manipulate people like that? Ah, this tendency is with all of us, isn't it? This tendency is with all of us. We all need healing. We all have a tendency to be selfish and to push God and others away. Consequently, no matter how much we have achieved in the past and in our circles of influence and socialization, we all need healing. We all need to become more whole. And because uh, of the grace of God, we have that opportunity. We do. We don't have to get caught up in warrings and fightings and bitter spats. But James tells us there's some more resources available. There's a different kind of wisdom available. James says there's another wisdom. There is another wisdom that comes from above. I wouldn't lie to y'all, he's saying. I'm on the clock, so I'm not playing games with you. This wisdom is first pure. It is filled with truth. But it is peaceable. It's not the kind of truth you just use to tell somebody off and you destroy them as a person. No, it's, it's truth that is gentle and peaceable, he says. It's something that wells up on the inside of you that lets you know that God loves you. God loves the other person. God loves what you're becoming. God loves what the other person is becoming if we are all trying to walk in the spirit. And when conflict arises, James says, it's willing to yield. That means give up your own position. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not talking about give, giving up your position in Christ or giving up your position in the word. But it does mean at times you're willing to let some things go and act like it never happened. It's willing to yield. It is willing to defer. It is full of mercy. This wisdom produces good fruit. I'm in the Bible. I'm reading right from the text. And it doesn't show partiality. And is without hypocrisy. Wow, James. As this preacher standing before us gets ready to close. Where does this wisdom come from, James? Beginning at verse 6, James has an answer. He shifts the focus as he describes how we can walk in and be immersed in that peaceful wisdom, that authentic and unselfish wisdom, that grace-filled and unhypocritical wisdom. And he describes a process of drawing nearer to God. That's how you get this wisdom. We draw nearer to God, stepping closer to God, because it is said, if we will take one step, God will take to yeah. what he's done for others. He will do for you. Yeah. James says, resist God, that God resists the proud, uh -huh. but he gives grace to the humble. The, the proud are those who think they can make it without submitting their will to God's will. The proud are those who only consult with their own thoughts or the advice of folk who don't have Plenty of the fruit of the spirit, spirit of the Lord at work in their own lives as Psalm 1 described in our earlier reading. But the humble are the opposite. The humble are prime real estate for God to walk all through. The humble submit their time, their minds to the word of God, to the advice of God, to the counsel of God. The num humble know when to be silent in the presence of God. Sometime after you've prayed, after you've praised, after you've read the word, it pays just to be still and know that God is God. There's a certain humility in sitting before God and just saying, God, listen, I've asked all that I know to ask. I've done all that I know to do. Now I just want to minister to you by sitting right here. Why? Because I'm drawing closer to you and I need your wisdom in my life. Therefore, James says, humble yourselves to God, resist the devil, and the devil will get scared. The devil will become a coward. If you resist the devil, if you say no to the devil, instead of yielding to his temptation, instead of yielding to his wisdom, James make a promise that Jesus can back up. 
James said, the devil will run away from you and God will draw near to you. Because if you will take one step, an earnest step toward a closer walk with Jesus, God will take two, God will take three, God will take four. You say, Pastor, how do I take a step toward God? Can you tell me in a minute or two? Yes, I can. <laughs> it's in the text. Humble yourself. Bow down to God's word on whatever matter you need guidance or correction. Don't know the scriptures very well, you say. Don't know the various promises in the word of God nor do you know the corrections that are in the word of God? If that's you, then Google. Let Google be your friend. Use Google as a tool of sanctification. Use Google to lead you up to the doorway of the scriptures regarding any subject. You can Google any subject related to your spiritual walk in God and say, God, I need a scripture related to peace. I need a scripture related to lust. I need a scripture related to how to be more giving. I need a scripture related to how to be more forgiving. If you Google, scriptures will come up. So let Google be your friend as you walk up to the door of sanctification. Meditate on how God wants you to treat other people particularly those who are vulnerable. Peruse the promises of God and claim them. Claim things like he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Google and claim things like no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but every tongue that rises against me in judgment, God will condemn. Claim that you will be forgiven because you're walking in forgiveness. Claim that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and those who try to destroy my body will be destroyed by God. These are promises of God. Yeah. But also claim, young person and singles and seasoned saint, that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I will not be lying around town getting down. No, I'm going to get up and live with discipline yes. and not share myself until he puts a ring on it as Beyonce said yes. or until she says yes God is not some kind of cosmic killjoy God wants you to have fun and pleasure yes. but God knows that sometimes what we engage in will only break our hearts uh -huh. or bring about disease and the grieving of the Holy Spirit so James says humble yourself to the word Draw closer, and when we do, we will discover that there all along, God was there all along. Yes, yes. There is actually a theological error in the title of this sermon. Mm. I hid it from you until now. The title is, you take one step, and God will take two, or three, or four, the Muslims, the Jews, Native Americans, Africans, Christians, we've all made similar claims in our sacred texts. If we draw closer to God, God's going to draw closer to us. But let me let you in on something that is more accurate spiritually as I get ready to sit down. Because as we draw closer to God, as we do what we do to draw closer to God, whether it is to pray, whether it is to fast, whether, whether it is to meditate on God's word or, word or serve our neighbors with thanksgiving in our hearts. It is as we do these acts that something amazing will happen. Our perception of where God is will change. Our consciousness of God becomes more alive. The one who was always present seems closer to us though he never moved. Howard Thurman, that great mystic and Christian philosopher, one time dean of the Rankin Chapel at Howard University, tells the story of when he was visiting a large city, he was lecturing in this city about spiritual things and he had a break and he went out during his lunch break. He went out to the local park, very large park. It was a sunny day with blue skies and beautiful cloud formations. 
He took his jacket off, he laid on the grass, laid on his back, and he just spent the next 20 minutes or so looking up at the blue skies and the cloud formation. As he looked up intently, he was suddenly jolted out of his gaze at the sky when a friend walked up, a friend walked up nearby and said, Howard, is that you? How are you? Howard Thurman said, listen, I'm fine. I'm just relaxing, looking at the cloud formations. His friend standing right close to where Thurman was reclining said, Howard, do you see what I see? Thurman was like, what, what do you see? Do you see what I see? Look right there. It is as plain as day. It looks just like the bust of George Washington. And Thurman did. He looked where he had been looking for the last half an hour. Thurman had been looking at that same cloud formation all that time, and he had noticed that there was this resemblance. It was there all along. He just needed someone to help him with his gaze. Listen, sisters and brothers, this is the work of the Spirit. This is the work of the spirit in our lives. As we are seeking, as we are resting, as we are drawing closer and humbling ourselves, it is the spirit's job to say, hey, Howard, hey, Greg, hey, Melissa, hey, Lisa, hey, Kenyatta, hey, Kevin, do you see what I see? Do you see God in all these formations that are taking place and situations in your life? As we draw closer to God, God doesn't have to take any steps because God never left. Didn't Jesus promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us? When we draw closer, it just changes our self-perception and our perception of God. Then we're able to see God's formation in our finances, in our relationships, in our church relationships, in our vocation, in our education, in our lives. If you take one step, to be truthful, God is already there. Yeah. We just have to open our eyes. Maybe there's, here, there's one here today. You need the Lord in your life. You haven't been present, or uh, really perceptive rather, of his presence. You know that in a lot of ways you've been living your life selfishly. At this time, God knows. God cares. He knows how we can be. Why don't you turn it all over to the Lord and have a new Lord in your life? Let someone else sit on the throne of your life. Why don't you come forward or if you're online watching, why don't you call the church's number five? Three seven? Five three seven. Two five nine zero. It's been a while since I've quoted that. Five three seven two five nine zero. Call that number, leave a message, and the leaders will get back to you. T tell uh, leave a message saying you want to you want to join the Lord. Or I want to join this church. Or I want to reaffirm my faith. In the sanctuary, the same invitation is extended to you right now. Won't you come? Yeah. You can stand at this time. Won't you come? We invite you to come. There's nothing better. Won't you come? You can stand. We might as well stand for the invitation. We might as well stand for the invitation.